because he was the first one to really explain the Holy Spirit's uh, involvement in the work of redemption, and he structured it so clearly and put so much time and effort into it that it came out as the definitive standard of the Holy Spirit that we still use today. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's clear uh, in Calvin that that the Holy Spirit is the agent of application. That uh, the immediate work of the Holy Spirit is, is uh, the means by which the benefits of what Christ has accomplished on the cross are applied to believers. So what Christ accomplished, the Spirit applies. Redemption accomplished and applied. That great title of John Murray's uh, uh, brief uh, monogram, accomplished, applied. What Christ has accomplished, the Spirit applies, and you go right down the order of salutis, and uh, at each at each juncture, from you know regeneration, effectual call to uh, justification, uh, adoption, sanctification, uh, perseverance, right, the, right, the whole the whole work of applying uh, Christ is uh, is the work of the Holy Spirit. All right, uh, what is an example of common grace? People love their children. Excuse me? People love their children. Good one. Yeah. The love, love that people have for their children. The rain falls on the just and the wicked. Right. Right. From, from the end of, the, of chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, people that do, the, you know, the Boy Scouts who let, uh, help the little old lady across the road. And that people do good works at all. And good things. And general suppression of evil. Suppression of evil creation of governments, um, police forces, military that keep bad guys from crossing the border, and good laws, just laws, and so forth. All right, uh, what do we say about those who've never heard the gospel? Hopefully you're saying they're lost. There's no hope of salvation apart from Christ. All right, what do we mean by free will? We're free to do what we want to choose. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can you can go. You can write a whole uh, treatise on this one, uh, as indeed uh, Luther did, and so did Jonathan Edwards, um, to name two. Um, so free, it, it depends on. It depends on. What do we mean by it? Well, it depends on what you mean. Uh, you mean do we have the ability to choose? Yes, we do. Are we responsible for our choices? Yes, we are. Uh, does this mean that uh, we have the capacity to believe and obey God? No, it does not, because we are in bondage to sin. Uh, and so free will properly speaking, only applies to Adam uh, and what is restored of that freedom of the will in Christ. Uh, but uh, for the generality of humanity, there is no freedom of the will. We're in bondage to sin. And it's only in Christ that we are liberated from that bondage. Whoever sins, Jesus says, is a, is a slave of sin. All right, list the fourfold state of man and indicate the capabilities of the human will in each of these four states. So this, there's the state of inno innocence. And uh, what's, what's this? What's the passe, uh, picari, passe, passe non picari. All right, passe, picari, passe, non picari. Possible to sin, possible not to sin. In the state of sin. Passe, picari. Non passe, non picari. Non passe, non picari. Not possible not to sin. Always sinning. No matter what you're doing, you're sinning. You're either doing what's wrong, you're doing what's right for the wrong reason. Uh, in a state of grace. The same as the first, but different. <laughs> yeah, the same, but different. Positive card, positive non card. And a state of glory. Not possible to sin. Not possible to sin. Okay, how are the benefits of Christ's death applied to us? By the Holy Spirit working through the Word. Uh, what is man's role in the effectual call? Yeah. Zero. 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 Yeah, literally. Just think of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel uh, 37, and you've got uh, the right picture. Okay, shorter catechism, question number 29. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? And as I tell our shorter catechism students on Sundays, uh, some of these are fairly easy because they give you half of the answer in the question itself. 
Together, we are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. All right, so there's the whole point that we're making about the Holy Spirit. He is the agent of application. The effectual application of the redemption purchased by Christ is by the Holy Spirit. So you have an exalted view of the Holy Spirit in, in the whole Reformed tradition. I know that drives charismatics crazy uh, to think of Calvin as the theologian of the Holy Spirit. But in terms of the history of theology, yeah, in terms of the, uh, yeah, in terms of the history of theology, that is the case. All right, what is justification? Judicial declaration of righteousness. All right, uh, one one answer: the judicial justification of, uh, declaration of righteousness. So the, the confession says, those whom God effectually calleth and also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them. Who says justification is the infusion of righteousness, placing righteousness in you? That's Roman Catholic. That's the Roman Catholic view. No, the infusing of righteousness into them, but, but by pardoning. So you remember at the beginning we said the confession is trying to drive a wedge between the Anabaptist radicals on the left and the Roman Catholics on the right. And so here we're dealing with the, uh, the Roman Catholics. They want an infusion of righteousness rather than an imputation of righteousness. And by, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, reckoning them to be righteous not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith. So you have the ground is the obedience and satisfaction of Christ, and then you have the instrument of, of, of justification, which is faith. Which faith they have not of themselves. Even that is a, is a gift of God. So perhaps, let's see, how many paragraphs was I supposed to read today? None of them. All right, so here's, here's, a, here's a hopefully a helpful way to think about these things. Uh, there is a plus and a minus in justification. Uh, the minus of justification is that guilt is removed. Guilt is forgiven. That's half of what we mean by justification. Uh, then there is the plus side of justification. Righteousness is credited. So some of these texts we'll look at in a minute. Romans 5.19 um, and uh, Philippians 3.9. Through faith alone, and we'll see more about this in chapter 14, and section 2, based upon the obedience and satisfaction of Christ, um, which, um, which uh, we can uh, speak of in terms of active, as later, and passive obedience of Christ. So the... Uh, Obedience being active obedience, uh, Christ came to fulfill all righteousness, of uh, uh, Matthew 3, uh, 15. Satisfaction is, is, we sometimes think about that, or speak of that as his passive obedience, his yielding up of himself on the cross. So there's the life of active obedience, submitting himself to the law of God, fulfilling all righteousness, and then there is the sub submitting of himself to the authorities, Jewish and Gentile, and uh, being uh, offered up as a sacrifice for the sake of our sins. Um, the, notice the word atonement is not in the, uh, in the Westminster Confession. Uh, that uh, is because of the language that was used in theology at the time, the Latin background, satisfactio, um, that should be T-I-O, satisfactio was the word that was used for later, the English word at atonement. Atonement's an English word, at one meant atonement. 
Um, but the theological language of that era would have been satisfaction. So the Savoy Declaration, 1658, adopted by the Congregationalists, added this language by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and soul righteousness. Okay, that's the, you know, that's the That's the overview of justification. That, uh, Terry, would you say that the act of obedience of Christ is missing from a lot of gospel presentations in the evangelical world compared to the... I don't think the categories are, uh, are recognized typically at all. Active and passive obedience. And, you know, there's been people who've said, well, how passive is it to, you know, to surrender to the authorities and let yourself get nailed to the cross? I mean, there's people that don't like just that language of passive. It's... That's at, you are actively submitting and, and rendering yourself as a sacrifice. But I, I think it's helpful categories to think in terms of there's, there's the righteousness that he earns and then imputes to us by a life of, of, uh, of righteousness. So that's the crediting of the righteousness. The righteousness of his obedience is credited to us. And, the, um, and then uh, his... Uh, his bearing of sin is uh, the way that is, it's through which the guilt is taken away. So if I'm not being clear up to this point, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about his act of obedience being credited to us. He led a rich, rich, uh, righteous life. We get uh, the benefit of that righteous life uh, through, uh, through uh, the uh, declaration of, of, uh, of uh, the, through the God's uh, de declaring our, our justification. So by bearing our sins, the passive obedience, he takes away our guilt. That's the minus. By living a righteous life, we are, we are that, that, that righteousness that he earned, uh, that then is credited to us. So that we are, you know, to use another metaphor, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So that when Christ looks at, when God looks at us, he sees us clothed in Christ's righteousness. We are credited with his righteousness. Yes. I think, too, that just the act of obey, he obeyed all of the law, so he actively obeyed. It wasn't just that he didn't sin, and it was an act, right? Yes. He actively obeyed. He, yeah. Yes, he did. Not yes. just passively didn't sin. Uh, submitted, submitted himself to the will of the Father, obeyed all of the commandments, um, lived a perfectly righteous life. That's the act of obedience. Uh, uh, and, and it's that righteousness with which we are credited. His own righteousness, his own demonstrated righteousness, his life of righteousness is, uh, is what we are credited with. Uh, okay, what, what is the difference between uh, infusing, in, in, infusing and imputing uh, the righteousness of justification? But... Uh, I think it'd be helpful probably before we answer that to go ahead and just look at the way in which the scripture handles this theme. Um, here, here's my favorite verse. This is the one I used to quote at sorority parties. Um, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted, counted to him as, as righteous. Was he righteous? No. Was he counted as righteous? Yes. Uh, how? By faith. Abraham believed. See, Abraham believed God, and it was counted. Uh, the older versions reckoned, considered as righteous, though he was not righteous. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted. There's that word again, as a gift, but, but as what is due. But the one who does not work, so works do not enter into this at all. This is where I think, this is as emphatic in, in my view, this is as emphatic as it gets right here. The one who does not work, but what? Believes. In him who justifies in there. Ah. Justifies the what? The ungodly. Justifies the ones that clean up their acts. Justifies the ones who, who have it all together. Uh, the justifies the ones who've turned over a new leaf. No. What, what, is, that, what is their moral, spiritual condition when, when, when 
uh, when they are justified. They are ungodly. So I, I don't think it gets any clearer than right here. The, the beauty of the doctrine of justification, I think, is in, in vivid display right here. The one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. They are ungodly and they're justified. They are counted as righteous. Why? By faith. They are reckoned righteous, credited with the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified by what? By faith. We have peace with God. I wanted to know how that typically worked out for you at the sorority party. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that case? Yeah. It, it may explain why I, why I was not as popular as I hoped to be. <laughs> Uh, so back, back to Romans 5, 15 and 16, the, the free gift is not like the trespass. This is, uh, we looked at this earlier, the comparison between um, Adam and, and, and Christ, Christ coming as the second Adam and doing what, um, doing what uh, through his obedience, what Adam failed to do because of his disobedience. For if many, if many died through the one man's trespass, many more much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the, of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one tras trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many tras trespasses brought justification. And then, ironically enough, I've left off verse 19, which is really the most important of the verses, and it's the clearest of the verses. Uh, so verse 19 says, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The one man's obedience the many are made righteous. How's that? Well, they're credited with his righteousness. R.C. Sproul used to talk about in, the alien righteousness, that if in, in distinction between the imputation and the infusion, that it's just it's a righteousness that has nothing to do with us. It's separate from us, strange to us. So an alien righteousness is always helpful for me. Yeah, I was going to spring the seat down here. Justitia aliena, alien righteousness. Yes, a very, very, very important. That's, that's Luther's Luther's language. It's an alien righteousness. In other words, it's not ours. It's not like it came from outer space. It's alien to us. It's uh, it's not our righteousness. It doesn't belong to us. It's, it's not uh, something that uh, is characteristic of us even. It's foreign to us. That's, that's another way of putting it. Then Galatians 2.16, six times in this one verse, he affirms justification by faith alone. So watch, watch, watch him um, uh, state and then repeat and then repeat again and then repeat again. We know that a person is, there's one, not justified by works of the law, but two, through faith in Jesus Christ. So, that, so we also have three, believed in Christ Jesus, four, in order to be justified by faith in Christ, Five, not by the works of the law, because six, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So again, I mean, how, how does the Apostle Paul say it any more clearly than that, more emphatically, with more repetition, to get across the point that we are saved by faith in Christ and not by any good works that we have done? So justification, the shorter catechism, is an act of God's free grace, whereby he pardons all our sins there's the negative, and accepts us as righteous in his sight. There's the positive. Um, accepts us as, not for, not for the, now I've gone blank on it. Um, accepts us as righteous, righteous, uh, righteous in his sight. Uh, not only, for only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's uh, like one of the ones I'm supposed to so I try again. Justification, an act of God's free grace, whereby he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Y'all have an amen out there? Amen. 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 Yes, all right. Okay, Here, here's the cla a classic text. You want to go back to that again and again. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not of your own doing. What not of your own doing? The whole thing, even your faith is not of your own doing. It is the gift. You see, you see the kind of language, grace, faith, gift. And then not as a result of works and not of your own doing. Why? So that no one would boast. So that the, the gospel doctrine is such that it doesn't leave any, any, any room for pride, any, any room for boasting, bragging, uh, feelings of superiority to anyone else because you're a believer and they're not a believer. You're saved. They're, they're not saved. You're a Christian. They're not a Christian. You're trying to live a moral life. They don't care about living. You, you can't boast about any of that. The whole thing is a gift. So that um, no one will boast. Now, he says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 1, repeatedly. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so were you th thinking you were superior to anyone else? No, you can't, because it's by his doing. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You can't boast about your religious accomplishments or your moral accomplishments. Uh, those are all gifts of God to you, and you're, you're not superior. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? All right, so... Yeah, the Arminian cannot affirm that. Um, that yeah, would be our argument. Are. Our, our argument would be that because you say the grace is provenient and it's universal, that ultimately what distinguishes me from the other guy is uh, my decision, my virtue, my insight, my wisdom. I decided to believe. You didn't decide to believe. We all had the equal chance. So what makes the difference between you and between me, between you and me? I, I responded and you didn't. So that, that leaves some room for boasting. I can say I'm better than, you know, for, for if, if, if there's any, any molecule of salvation for which I can take credit, I can boast that of my superiority over, over another. Uh, Philippians 3.9, almost as an aside in the third chapter of Philippians, Paul speaks of him be, of being found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Clear, huh? It's just clear. But which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. Not a righteousness of our own, a righteousness that, that is given to us by God. It comes to us from God. How? Through faith. See also mm -hmm. Titus 3, 5, Romans eleven six. 6. So another of Luther's formulas was simul just et peccator, at once just and sinner. That's a Romans 4, the Romans 4, 5 point. You are ungodly and you are justified. You are at the same time. You are a sinner and you are just. Just because you're credited with the righteousness of Christ and yet a sinner by your own practice and behavior and nature. Uh, so, and, and this uh, alien righteousness, it's external to us. It's, uh, it's not something that is true of us per se. Okay, um, what's the difference between infusing and imputing the righteousness of justification? How is righteousness re 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 uh, received? Infusion would be you being given your own righteousness versus imputing and getting the righteousness of someone else, in this case, correct? Yeah, so, so the, um, the Roman Catholic view is like, um, grace is like gasoline. Uh, that you put into the car, you gas up the car, that grace then enables you to do the good works. So you get this infusion of grace and energy that then, uh, um, then allows you, enables you, empowers you to do the good works whereby you um, merit justification. And that then runs down, and so you go back to church, and uh, the sacrament of confession or penance, uh, the sacrament of, uh, of the Eucharist, and that then gas, you get gassed up again. You get, you get uh, en energy, grace, grace then is infused again into the soul, and then you're able again to go out and do the good works whereby you can earn your justification. So that, that's infusing. It's, more, it's closer to what we call regeneration. They, 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 they see it as a, a, a putting of a righteous principle in you that prompts and motivates and enables you to do righteous things. And thereby you earn justification. 
right? I, I know that they also believe in the necessity of the atoning death of Christ, but what, I mean, how do they um, integrate those two things? What's the necessity of Christ's death on the cross if you can have righteousness infused to enable you to to obey the law. Well, that grace comes to us through his death. I mean, the, be the benefit of that infusion of grace is something that is uh, a benefit that flows to us from the cross of Christ. He established the gas station. Yeah, and, he, and uh, he's pumping the gas. Now, with the Catholics, we move more to a neutral state. You now we have to work with faith. We have to work with that righteousness in order to achieve salvation. Which is what you're doing when you go out and you do your works. Right, as opposed to being moved into complete justification, moved into it. Yeah, and so in a Catholic view, justification is never complete. It's never complete in this life. And, and that's why you're going to spend uh, hundreds of thousands of years in purgatory. And then, like you said, it's a process. It's something that occurs over time where we believe in imputation, which is an event. It's a Yes, it's I, it's it's, bam. Yeah, there's a, there's just a different there's a confusion of terminology and concepts between what the Protestants are, are arguing and believe and what Roman Catholics do. So it's a confusion of justification and sanctification. It's a confusion of justification and regeneration. Um, these things are 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 all ultimately joined together, but they have to be kept distinct, or you get you get uh, get get off track very very quickly. Didn't this view cause some of the early church fathers to delay their baptisms to late in life so they got the most bang out of the body? Yes, yes. That was a practice. I think it's denounced by Augustine and others, but yes, it was a practice. So you get that last infusion of grace so that you are closer to the status of just justification. And there was some dispute as to whether or under what circumstances or in what way you would be given, be forgiven sins after your baptism. So that's why you want to delay it. So. Mm -hmm. Right, so for most people to get baptized as an infant, um, but then they get grace at confirmation and then they get grace at the Lord's table and they get grace at confession and uh, they get grace when they get married and they get last rites or um, extreme unction, they get grace then, and if you're ordained, you get grace. So, you know, you're, you're, you're tanking up. You're tanking up, you're running it down, you're going back and you're tanking up more grace, more good works. It, um, so, you, in, a, in a sense, you could say that you don't get credit for the good, uh, good works because you couldn't do them without grace, but on the other hand, you are doing the good works, and other people getting that grace are not doing the good works. Uh, yes. So, <coughs> In, so like for Presbyterians with the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and Baptism those are we, we refer to that as receiving means, 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 means of grace. grace how would that be different than the Catholic or is it because the Catholics think this is somehow allowing them to earn their salvation yes yes and you know and they're not ambiguous about this the Council of Trent's uh, you know, very clear that you do meritorious works. So the, the infusion of grace enables you to do the meritorious works whereby you earn justification. So we say we're, we're, get, we're, we're um, receiving grace through the means of grace, the word sacraments and prayer, in order to enable obedience and service, but not in order to save ourselves. So that's pretty fundamentally different. Grace is enabling us um, to obey and to serve uh, but it's, it's not enabling us to earn or merit our salvation. So we're basically getting gassed up as well, but it's just not for the purpose of salvation. You, if you could put it that way. <laughs> I'm not saying I would put it that way. <laughs> Might not be a good answer for the test. <laughs> uh, so in, in the imputing is... Uh, of, of righteousness, however, is a is a um, is, is a declaration of righteousness. It doesn't involve a transformation of anything. It's not a. Uh, it's a, it's it's a it's a verdict that is being rendered. It is a status that is being conferred. Um, in, in, infusion is a 
and energy that's being received. Um, whereas in imputing is this new, new uh, position, a new status based on a declaration of righteousness. How, how is the righteousness received? It's received by faith and it's paragraph two. Faith thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Yet, okay, we're, we're gonna blaze that path between the Roman Catholics and uh, uh, well, actually, we're gonna, we're gonna stay right on that, blazing that path, and we're gonna com complete this punch against the Roman Catholics, yet it is not alone in the person justified. Well, really, we're going after the antinomianism, antinomians on the other side. So the Anabaptist radicals are being addressed by this as well as the Roman Catholics. Yet, uh, uh, faith is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied, accompanied with all other saving graces and is no dead faith. That's, of course, James 2, faith without works is dead, but worketh by, by love, um, also James 2. So it is the instrument alone, we say by faith alone, but uh, the faith that justifies, it never is alone. We're it's saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. Yes. So, and, and that's nuanced, but it's absolutely crucial. It's not, uh, it's not uh, mere assent. We'll, we'll get to that later. Yes? Um, the end of the line, all other saving graces, what does that mean? Um, uh, all other saving graces, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, the Beatitudes, uh, uh, you know, poverty of spirit, uh, grief for sin. Hunger and thirst for righteousness are, are um, accompanied faith. Faith alone saves, but genuine saving faith never is alone. That is the point. It is accompanied by these other qualities. Is current Catholic belief, I know the, the current hope is universalist, but is the current Catholic belief that everybody goes to purgatory, nobody goes to hell? Uh, except for super saints. Super saints go straight to heaven. Everybody yeah. else will pay off all their debts oh, yeah. eventually in purgatory and oh, make yeah. it to heaven. Unless, unless you, you had a special indulgence like Tetzel was offering during the Reformation. But it, I mean, I'm talking about even non-believers, right? Even somebody that oh, I think non-believers go to hell. Catholics still believe that. That's they're supposed to. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> the current hope current is universal. Yeah. Right. He says right, right. Right. But, but that's not what Catholic doctrine teaches. That Catholic doctrine teaches that Protestants are all going to hell. Yeah. Essentially, the difference between a purgatory and hell is just uh, one is temporary, the other is eternal. But right. the same thing's happening in both. Right. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're well, getting punished, you're, you're paying the penalty. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thomas? No. Uh, maybe it's just the Girl Scouts I hang out with, but I feel like they've so like moderated their language because they would basically sound like an evangelical, or many of them, maybe they're just telling me what I want to hear. But it's like, how do you actually talk to a Roman Catholic today and just be like, well, this is what you believe, because the Council of Trent said 400 years ago that this is what you believe. Well, that's the problem, um, I think. That the Council of Trent's never been repudiated, never been corrected, never been updated, because it can't be, because uh, the church is infallible. The, and when the Pope speaks, the Pope speaks ex cathedra. When he speaks ex cathedra, he speaks infallibly. So how do you say Trent was wrong? Uh, Trent, um, well, I'll, t I'll tell you how you say Trent is wrong. You don't call it wrong, but you adopt a, a theory of doctrine evolving. John Henry Newman. Um, was a great help to the Roman Catholic Church in the 19th century when he basically argued in order to stay the same, you have to change. And so that it, uh, that the, the, you know, what's, what's stated in one way in the first century evolves and, and it's, you, don't, you don't lose the fundamental principle, but it has to be restated in modern times in modern language. And so the concepts evolve um, over time. So it's like Protestant. It is. Well, it is. He wasn't a liberal, but it, it's similar to Protestant liberalism. Yeah, so, so Trent is all, is all there in all of its 
the, all of its authority for Roman Catholics. And uh, you know, as far as they're concerned, all non-Roman Catholics are going to hell, and basically all Catholics are going to spend time in purgatory except the saints. Because the justification is incomplete in this life because it's a process, and the process is never complete. Because it's never complete, it's got what was left undone by justification has to be um, has to be corrected in purgatory. The sin that still clings to your soul gets purged out in purgatory. And that, that process takes hundreds of thousands of years. Yes? I've got Catholic friends, and they talk about going to heaven. They never talk about going to purgatory. That's just something that the Catholic Church is downplaying. Yeah, but they all use birth control now, too. Yeah. It, 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 we, um, amongst themselves, they talk about cafeteria Catholics. You know, what do you, you go to the cafeteria, right? What, pick and choose. You pick and choose. You pick and choose what you want. So I'm going to not pick the purgatory people. I'm going to pick the heaven people. Yeah. So, okay, so the people a little bit older than I am remember when Catholics marched in lockstep uniformity prior to Vatican II. So Vatican II is 63 to 65. And their attendance was close to 90% every single week of the, of the, you know, the, the Catholic, Catholic members. And they did what they were told to do. And the, the nunneries and the, the convents and the monast monasteries, the monastic orders were full of people. And then Vatican II came around and moderated a lot of the Catholic practices. And when that happened, Catholic conformity plunged. Yeah, um, Rodney Stark edited a book with, uh, wrote a book with a, with a fellow author years ago about the churching of America. I think I mentioned it in a sermon not too long ago. The churching of America, 1776 to 2000. And it talks about how that, how that uh, the, the churches that have grown since 1776 have all been all the ones that have rigorous requirements. And that you can track the decline of denominations with when they begin to relax their rules. And uh, so, you know, it starts with the Puritans, very, very strict. They begin to relax their rules. They decline. Then come the, um, the Methodists. They're very, very strict. They become the largest denomination. Then they begin to relax in order to more broadly appeal. And so they tone down their doctrines and practices. And then they begin to decline. Then it's the Baptists, the surging Southern Baptists. You know, they, they then overtook the Methodists. And then, you know, and they, and, they, and they were socially ostracized, just like each of these groups, the Puritans. You know, they're socially ostracized, the Methodists, the they were despised. The, the Baptists, of course, they were despised too. Uh, and so, but uh, th then when they begin to get acceptance socially, then they begin to compromise their, uh, they, they, they begin more and more to, to seek social acceptance. They compromise their, their strictness and they relax their requirements. And, and that's exactly what happened with the Roman Catholics too. So even on purely pragmatic grounds, the seeker-sensitive church growth folks have it wrong. Yeah, they have it wrong. Ignoring the theology. <laughs> they, get just on they get a temporary rates. bump, temporary excess, uh, success. I would argue temporary success, long-term disaster. So their children, their children, they don't know the Lord's Prayer. They don't know the Apostles' Creed. They don't have, a, they don't have much respect for Christianity at all. Um, okay. Uh, where are we? Uh, 13, how can grace be free and yet satisfy the justice of God? I guess the question there is free to whom? Christ by his obedience and death did fully discharge the debt of all those that are justified and did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction. Notice that again the tenses of the verbs. He did make. This is a thing to be accomplished. Uh, he fully discharged the debt of all those that are justified and did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to, the, to his father's justice in their behalf. Yet, inasmuch as he was given by the father for them and his obedience and satisfaction ac accepted in their stead and both freely, not for anything in them, their justification is only of free grace that both the exact justice and rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. A beautiful paragraph, isn't it? This is magnificent. Uh, so, question 14. Um, 13, how can grace be free and yet satisfy the justice of God? Free to us, not free to Christ. There was a debt, right? That had to be paid. 
and that was paid at the cross. Free to the elect. Free, free to believers, free to the elect, free to us, freely bestowed to us. Yeah, free grace, but at a great cost, the cost of the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. So even in God's economy, no such thing. Nothing free lunch. No free lunch? Free. No yeah. free lunch. <laughs> All right, 14, relate justification. <clears throat> To A, time, B, sin subsequent to justification, C, Old Testament believers. So let's see what it says here. God did from all eternity decree to justify all the elect. And Christ did in the fullness of time, die for their sin and rise again for their justification. Nevertheless, they are not justified until the Holy Spirit doth in due time actually apply Christ unto them. So this is a, addressing, there was groups, uh, uh, contem contemporaries at the time of the writing of the confession that were arguing for eternal justification and in effect were making history irrelevant. So if, if, if God uh, justified you in eternity, then it doesn't matter whether you believe or not. And so the confession is saying you can be um, you can be predestined to be justified, but you are not justified until you actually put your faith in Christ. You are not saved until you repent of your sins and turn to Christ. So that in relation to time, uh, but so know, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes? They're, again, they're separating the decrees of God from God's use of means. And you can't separate those two things. No. No, and you can't, yeah. You can't, yeah, I mean, you, you can't, well, first of all, they've got, they've got the idea of justification wrong there, that we are not justified in eternity. We are, it is determined, I think the right way to speak it is, it is that God predestined us, determined that we would be justified. But the, we, the actual declaration of our justification takes place in time. It doesn't take place in eternity. It takes place in time when we believe. Our so in other words, history is meaningful. Every, you know, meaning is not all locked up in eternity and, and time is irrelevant and what we do is irrelevant. Um, you know, one of the critics of Calvinism it came up with this little, uh, um, little, uh, you know, little poem, Diddy. Yeah. You can but you can't, will but you won't, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, that's not true. Can but you can't, will but you won't, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And you could say the reverse, you know. And, and the reverse would be, well, it doesn't matter if you believe, you're saved, you're saved. You know, if God's determined to save you, you're saved, doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to believe, you don't have to do anything, you're saved. I mean, God already decided all that. Okay. But, but we still have you know, Romans 8, where Paul speaks in the past tense of those he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. All of that in the past tense, because God's decree is so certain, it is at least my take. Yes, um, which is the right conclusion. That's the point. It's certain. It, it's infallibly going to take place, but it must take place. Yeah, I, I was justified at a point in time, not in eternity past. Right. But God's decree in eternity <clears throat> past made it absolutely certain that that would happen when the Lord happened. Did. Right. Right. So Colossians 1.21, and, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. So there's a before and after. You, you weren't saved in eternity. Th your condition was you were alienated and hostile and you were doing evil. And, and now you're reconciled, but that's something that took place, that took place in time. That took place when you came to put your faith in Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2:12. Uh, remember that you were at that time before you came to faith in Christ, separated from Christ. You were justified and reconciled to God in eternity. No, you you were separated from Christ, alienated from the Commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was your condition. So there's a before and after, and the before and after is significant. So that's relation to time. 
Um, not, uh, five, God doth continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified, and although they can never fall from the state of justification, yet they may, by their sins, fall under God's fatherly displeasure and not have the light of his countenance restored unto them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. So this uh, uh, sins subsequent to justification, what's the confession saying? to us. So it's a forgiveness one. Well. They need to be confessed. Yes. They because continue to be forgiven because of Christ's work. Exactly. So, it, well, it's saying you, you're not going to lose your, your status as justified. You're not going to lose your salvation. But there will be some temporal consequences. So, so there's a, you know, through, because of your disobedience, your rebellion, your defiance, you fall under God's fatherly displeasure. You have the, the um, not have the light of his countenance restored. In other words, the sense of God's favor, that uh, you are one of his, part of his family, loved by God. You, you, you forfeit that until you humble yourself, confess your sin, beg pardon, renew your faith and repentance. So you don't lose, um, you don't lose your salvation. You don't, you don't uh, the, 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 the verdict of, of, of justification is not reversed, but there are temporal consequences. That, that are suffered. Uh, the, the next is uh, Old Testament believers. The justification of believers under the Old Covenant was in all these respects one and the same with the justification of believers under the New Testament. So this is a, we're, we're back to this theme again. Uh, correct? We have uh, dealt with this several times. How were Old Testament believers saved? The same way as Christ. Through faith. Faith in Christ. By, faith by the coming of the Yes. Okay, the point was that the types, the priests, the temple, start there, the temple, the labors, the altars, the priests, the sacrifices, all of that were signposts directing them to the Messiah who was to come. And they put their faith in the Messiah who was to come. Abraham, Galatians 3, had the gospel preached to him. Abraham, Jesus said, look forward to my day and rejoice. He anticipated the coming of the Messiah. The, uh, at Pentecost in Acts 2, David spoke of the resurrection of Christ in, uh, in Psalm 16. So they did. They were seeing um, they were seeing the benefits of Christ uh, in, in shadowy ways. It wasn't clear, perhaps, or certainly wasn't as clear as what we see this side of the incarnation. But I, I think that this this uh, verse in Romans um, three is illuminating where the Apostle Paul says that God is just and justifier. I wish I had thought of this earlier because yes, the divine forbearance, okay um, so it says in verse 25 of Romans 3, God put forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. All right, so what was going on in the Old Testament? Well, they're offering up these bulls and goats in sacrifices. What's the problem? That's not enough of a, of a, of a, of a payment. A bull and a goat cannot atone for human sin. They cannot pay the debt that's owed to a holy God. But God is passing over the sin. He's not punishing the sin. He's not demonstrating his just wrath against sin. And this is going on for generations. And yeah, Abraham and you know David and the Old Testament saints, they're believing. They're getting forgiven. They go on up to heaven. I mean, Moses and Elijah, there they are at the transfiguration. They, you know, Christ hadn't shed his blood for them. They just had the benefit of bulls and goats. 
So that, that qu raises a question mark about God's justice. That's what the Apostle Paul's talking about. It raises a question, what is God? God is just, well, what's he doing forgiving those Old Testament saints? He's passing over their sins without an adequate payment being made. And so there's a question mark being raised about the righteousness or the justice of God. So Christ is displayed, he says here, put forward as a propitiation by his blood to show God's righteousness because in the divine forbearance, so you have this public display of a propitiatory sacrifice of the Son of God whose, whose death is of infinite value uh, because in the divine for, forbearance for centuries he'd been passing over these sins and basically forgiving them and taking these people up into heaven and, and, and without there being an adequate payment. He's not trapped in time like we are. <laughs> he, he, he's not, but he's concerned about his reputation. And that's what the Apostle Paul's talking about. So that it was to show his righteousness at the present time. So that he might be just as the justifier. Just in justifying. Just in forgiving. Not just winking at sin and brushing it aside or, or sweeping it under the carpet. But seeing that it gets a, a public adequate payment for sin. Um, uh, through the display of his justice at the cross. You with me? Hang with me on that one. Question on time, on like the timing step of that. If we are not justified until we have faith in the work of Christ that was accomplished in history, would it kind of work the other way for like the Old, Old Testament saints that like they are not justified when they have faith because the work of the cross had not been accomplished. And so it wasn't until, like, at that cross moment, all of them then became justified. No, I think they were justified, and that was the problem. They were justified by their faith in the Messiah to come, but the payment had not yet been made. So Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 12, 4, 5. Genesis 12. Yes, so. Does that verse have propitiation for 319 or 321? 325 does. Yeah. So it, it changes, it immediately changes the Old Testament sacrifices from mere appeasement, appeasing wrath, to satisfying justice and, and averting wrath. The death of Christ changes the sacrificial system completely. Because the Old Testament sacrifice is merely a peace until the time it's justice, or until the debt is paid. I think that's a good distinction. That, that it was a temporary arrangement yeah. until the fullness of time, until the time would come when the adequate payment would be made. That's why propitiation is such an important word. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important to understand that they were putting their faith in the Christ who is to come. They were not trusting in the blood of bulls and goats. They were signposts to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. But did they know that? If you were, if you were to ask a priest from the, the Old Testament, did they have articulated that point that you just made? I'm not with the clarity with which I'm making it, um, but I would think that the better of them would know that there's a discontinuity between, a discrepancy between it's the, the sacrifice of a lamb and the debt of my, the, the weight and, and, and seriousness of my sin. Thomas? So in Revelation, it talks about the uh, lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So like, how do we reconcile that? That if the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, that's not correct. Yeah, planned. Planned, designated, purposed, predestined. But he wasn't actually. No. No. But, but decreed before the foundation of the world and therefore certain. That he should. That that's who he is. That's his identity. He's, and that's the work he will do. I mean, isn't that like a time-centric? Aren't we imposing that our view of time? Not yeah. Not yeah, I don't think we have any choice but to do that, do we? I mean, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We know when that happened. It happened in time. It didn't happen from the foundation of the world. It happened in time, and so... It must be a reference to that which had been ordained and decreed and determined. I, I guess it's, it's like it, it's already effectual. Like when Abraham died, 
You went to heaven. Yeah. Like they didn't wait around for two thousand years. Yeah, and the, but that's the problem. He did. He did. He didn't deserve it. So is God really just? So Christ demonstrates he's just when he justifies. He's the just and justifier. When he justifies, he's just. And, and, and it, it, that had to be displayed. It had to be displayed out there in public. Because this whole question about why are these people going to heaven and the price hasn't been paid. Just these blood of bulls and goats, it's not up, it's not up to the task. It's a better covenant. It is a better covenant. So summary, before the break. Justification is a verdict, it is not a process. It's a declaration, it's not transformation. It's imputed, it's not infused. It takes place in a moment of time, it does not take place over the passage of time. It's instantaneous, it's not lifelong, it's by faith, it's not faith plus works. It's by grace, not obedience to the law of God. It is a gift, it is not merited, it is forensic, it is not restorative. What does that mean? Sorry. Law. Law, a matter of law. It is a verdict, a legal verdict. Okay. Yes. How would, I guess, the, <clears throat> the barrel like the sower working with that, I guess, like, like, um, kind of rejoices, but then when the trials and testing come, they fall away. So I guess, you, I guess, between them and God are actually genuinely having faith in the crucified versus if it's. I guess I'm asking, I guess I'll, like, I'll yeah, but I'm going to I'm going to put you on hold because we got a we got a chapter on perseverance of the saints. All right, let's take a break.